Today's podcast comes uh, by the suggestion of retired Special Agent Harry Richardson, who pointed out to me one day, uh, approximately a couple of weeks ago, that we, not a lot of people know about what we're going to talk about today in this investigation, that we're very happy to have one of the case agents uh, here uh, to talk about it, Jiggs Kelleher, who was, um, had really a terrifying experience <laughs> from my point of view uh, to, uh, to conduct this investigation at the North Pole, basically. As, as, as one of the pictures that Jiggs sent me has Nisra North Pole, which I, I love, and that's gonna go on the podcast so that people can see a young Jiggs Kelleher um, before, um, you know, before he went, went through a whole career with uh, NIS, the Naval Investigative Service. But I wanted to give credit to Harry Richardson, who um, who uh, saw this podcast by the history guy on the internet um, regarding the murder on Ice Island, uh, which was T3 Fletcher's Ice Island, which I, I got to tell you, I didn't know we had these things. The only thing that I'd ever seen about an Ice Island was in the movies, you know, Ice Station Zebra. So that's the, that was kind of my, my, this must've been like ice station zebra because the Soviets were on icebergs and Americans were on icebergs, but they were doing mostly weather and geological work and, uh, you know, uh, measuring depths of the ocean, you know, all things that marine biologists do. Um, so you can imagine it's the, 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 when you're, when you're at a place like Fletcher's ice island, it must be like being in the, in space. In fact, I saw another podcast yesterday on this particular case, a Brit guy who was talking about it. And he said, no, get ready because this could happen again, but in space. <laughs> so <laughs> when we talk about this particular case, which is a really fascinating case for the Naval Investigative Service at the time, which became the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, it, we, it, it's, it, this is the kind of cases that we as special agents often get. Uh, where you're called out of the blue to go to some place remotely and uh, conduct an investigation um, which has these fascinating experiences that guys like Jiggs Callaher, who will come on in just a second, um, experienced. Uh, so uh, really excited about that. In fact, Jiggs, I, I want him to talk about this because one of the things he mentioned in one of the documents that he sent me is he has a trivia question that stumps everybody. And I'll let him, I'm not going to give that away because I want Jigs to talk about that. He can, he can tell what his trivia question is because he has a unique experience. Um, so I want to welcome uh, retired special agent Jigs uh, Callaher to the program today. Jigs, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Lee, for that uh, introduction. I uh, appreciate being on and I'm happy to document this uh, experience that I had at Fletcher's Ice Island in 1970. And I've been an agent, uh, uh, I've been retired for 38 years now. Wow. So uh, there's a, a, a long space of time, over 50 years since this occurred. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my memory is, uh, has been lost, but I'll do my best. Well, I've, I gotta uh, tell you, I'm excited because we've talked before the interview and on the phone a couple of times, and uh, your memories are as sharp as sharp as attack. I mean, I've read a bunch of stuff now and watched a couple of videos on Fletcher's Ice Island. Um, what a unique experience. Can you tell me how, how this all came about and how you were selected for this mission? Well, tell me a little bit about the special ops team that you were assigned to and, uh, and then how you were selected for this mission. I'll do that. I started with... Uh... Uh, background investigations in Chicago in 1961 and after five years was sent to St. Louis or after six months went to St. Louis and uh, then had Central Illinois for uh, four or five years and was transferred to Cuba for my first activity with uh, criminal investigations. And then after two years at Gitmo with the family and experiencing uh, the isolation there that from 66 to 68 was uh, transferred to headquarters and uh, went into a special operations group of six uh, investigators that uh, we worked under Jack Donnelly and one of the hats that he had at headquarters. And those six investigators had access to every location 
that we had an office mm -hmm. and it didn't matter location wise uh, we had the the right as doing a headquarters uh, or origin case uh, we were we were able to uh, go into somebody's area and conduct the investigation with or without them mm -hmm. and that's how this all came about with regard to one uh, one night on a Sunday night I was grilling steaks at my home in Springfield, Virginia. And De Jack Donnelly called me and asked me if uh, I'd like to volunteer for something that he'd love for me to do. And I said, Jack, I'll go anywhere, anytime. I said that when I came on board and I'm in it. And he said, well, he kind of uh, grasped at something called ice something. And I thought he said Iceland. And I said, sure, I'll go. And the next day I found out it was Ice Island which is uh, T3, and uh, it's uh, six by three miles in, in size. It's 90 feet thick, and it's floating 200 miles from the North Pole, and there's a murder investigation. And I'm sure glad that you and Dick McKenna have volunteered to do this. <laughs> and, and I said, how are we getting there? And he says, nobody knows. Oh. And, and for the next, next 10 days, we uh, grappled with how to, to uh, get us and the um, the other two gentlemen that came with us, one a, a U.S. Coast Guard uh, uh, petty officer who we used to do the uh, the at at sea arrest of uh, uh, in connection with this case, and uh, that was all that the Coast Guard would allow him to do, and the other was Justin Williams who talked his way on as if uh, he wanted the experience. He was a bachelor and working at the Eastern District of Virginia uh, courthouse. And uh, he uh, he says, you may need me up there if this thing gets hot with regard to whether uh, we have jurisdiction or not on a, uh, a, a keg of ice uh, that's uh, floating in the, at five miles a day uh, close to the North Pole. So Justin came and he was he was a benefit, if nothing else, his guitar music in the mess hall when we had a break. <laughs> but uh, that that's the way it started. But uh, the next the next 10 days before we could leave, we had a lot of jurisdictional aspects uh, in connection with this case. Uh, first of all, I was going to finance it. Everybody that was involved was uh, either government uh, employed uh, and uh, that that would take care of that. The Air Force uh, chipped in with uh, two C-130s and uh, uh, two uh, H-3 helicopters, uh, and uh, we wound up uh, going from uh, the four of us uh, got in a, uh, in a C-130 at Pease Air Force Base and flew to Tule, Tule Air Force Base and. Uh, uh, in Greenland, and that was a, a briefing period and a resting period, and we got our cold, cold weather outfits there, and uh, then the next morning left for uh, the northern section of, of, of Canada, uh, where we got into the, we were in the H-3 helicopter at that time. So you flew from you flew from Peace Air Force Base to Thule Air Force Base in a C-130, and then you switched over to this H-3. Yeah, then we stayed there overnight. Okay. And, and we had briefings with regard to the two uh, pilots that were coming in from England, mm -hmm. because one of them had experience in cold weather air to air refuelings. Mm -hmm. And we were aware that this was the first time it was ever going to be uh uh, attempted in the Arctic, mm -hmm. but remember it was in the late July and it was the hottest time of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, the sun never set and the ice, uh, the temperature of the ice and on top of it was 38 degrees. Mm -hmm. So it was not cold. It was, it was melting and the ice was crunching under our uh, boots as we walked uh, in, within the camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that didn't present any any particular problems and we had light all the time so we could work all night but uh, the pilots told us that night that uh, 
that the weather was going to be bad in 48 hours and we needed to get our work done. Uh, and we planned out our work from the standpoint of we knew that we had a dead body that was frozen and under ice. We knew that the suspect had been uh, removed from any duties and was essentially uh, staying in his hut for the 10 days that it took us to get there and uh, that everybody was anxiously waiting for us to come so that we could remove those two people and they could get on with their work. Jake, and, uh, I, so I have a question about that. So when you guys were taking this flight, I, I read in one of your documents that you overheard a conversation between the pilot and they said that this H3, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta literally gun it just so the C-130 was having a hard time um, yeah. of, of, you know, leading uh, the H-3 because it was flying slow. Yeah, that that uh, that was kind of a suck up time. Uh, both uh, Dick and I had on our, uh, uh, I don't know if this is going to show or not. There you go. There at Thule, and there you guys are on the H-3. Yeah, we're on the H three, and we have our uh, we ha we have our earphones on, and we're hearing the, the two chopper guys saying, uh, "Are we ready?" And uh, they said, "We're going to take on fuel." And then we we see this cord coming out of the uh, the H one thirty or the the, the uh, C one thirty, and the spike goes out, and it's trying to fish itself into the and uh, basket. They, they have a basket, uh -huh. and we're we're really close and i said how close are we and he says at at sometimes we're within 10 to 20 feet of the blades hitting oh, wow. hit, hitting the fuel line we got to be very careful and understand that the the helicopter had to be full speed mm -hmm. and the c-130 had to be going as slow as it could stay in the air but uh, it it worked and within 90 seconds we had a full load, he pulled away. Mm -hmm. And Dick and I looked at each other and kind of wiped our brow and said, hey, it worked the first time. <laughs> and then the next thing we hear is the pilot saying, uh, George, you've never done one of these, have you? He says, no. He says, you're doing one now. And we said, what? <laughs> you're practicing <laughs> on us? <laughs> and and he says, yeah. He says, I could have a heart attack and we don't, you'd all be dead. <laughs> Take over, George, you do the next one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It reminded, it reminded me of a doctor coming into my, uh, to, to one of my operations I had on my uh, abdomen. Mm -hmm. And he talked to the other doctor and he says, uh, have, uh, have you ever done one of these before? And they were, they were going to insert a permanent IV in me. He says, no, I've never, I've never done one. Has you ever, you ever watched one? He says, yeah, I've watched one. He says, you know what they tell us in medical school? You watch one, you you do one, and then you teach one. And he says, that's where I'm in. I'm at teaching session. <laughs> well, you were involved in the like the very first uh, Arctic review. The very, very first ever in July 1970 of anybody even trying an Arctic uh, refueling of an H3 helicopter. Wow. Uh, in the Arctic Circle. In the Arctic Circle. Yeah, in the Arctic Circle, yeah. Wow. But uh, anyway, that that went well. And uh, then we, we we were so tired at the time we got to T3, it didn't matter. They hooked up, he got gas, brought us down, we got off. And we had 30, 36 hours from then to conduct the investigation, uh, try to get everything together, collect the evidence, and uh, get back on our way. So this and, is uh, really interesting because... You know, the C-130 has to go back to what, Alert Canada? Is that where they stayed and waited? They, they were in Alert, and that's where the, that's, that's where the uh, chopper waited for us. Okay. And, and uh, they, so the, uh, uh, we, with, uh, I guess it was about sometime in late afternoon that we started, and we went systematically through the, uh, process of uh, looking at uh, checking the body and making sure everything was mm -hmm. uh, locked up well and that they had done a good job and okay. I th I'm thankful for the station manager at uh, uh, 
Point Barrow. He was right on top of it. His name was Britton, and he was in charge of uh, the uh, Naval Arctic Research Laboratory uh, at the Office of Naval Research in Point Barrow, Alaska. Mm. And he was the director of that program. And boy, he he he, he took charge over uh, ham radio that night of, of having everything uh, done properly with regard to the establishment of saving of the evidence and separating people and telling people uh, that they couldn't talk about this with each other. And so we walked into a fairly good situation, but uh, the- but that was really, but that was really interesting, Jigs, because it was either you wrote in a document you sent to me or in one of the articles that I read that the ham radio, when he radioed, because there was no other way they could communicate, that ham radio call was made to somebody in like, I mean, really far away, it was South America, or, or I'm not sure where it was, but it was nowhere near the Arctic Circle. No, and they rerouted them to a, a doctor on a May Day, a doctor picked up in uh, New Orleans. Oh, okay. And, and, and at that time, uh, Lightsey was, was still alive. Mm. They, uh, they, they still had heartbeat, but he didn't last more than 35 minutes. Mm. Uh, but that doctor told them to, how to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and mm -hmm. and they, they they tried that but mm -hmm. he eventually was uh, uh the, the doctor read, led him through three or four things that says no he's passed away uh sorry can't help you anymore and uh, so then they had his dead body on the on 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 the floor of of the place where he slept mm -hmm. and uh earlier uh one of about 30 minutes before that parody who was uh, uh, involved in the making of the wine, saw uh, Escamilla with the gun, uh, mm -hmm. pointing it at him and saying, no, uh, uh, we're not, you're not getting any more uh, uh, booze for Porgy. He, he about killed me a week ago. Mm -hmm. And that all came out after the fact. But so, because you... of that, we we knew what had happened, sure. And uh, and then we then we, we began uh, with uh, interviewing witnesses and Dick did the crime scene and okay. uh, I I uh, took statements and we went from there. So when you had uh, when you arrive in the helicopter, you guys jump off the helicopter with all your equipment. Uh, so when I joined the Naval Investigative Service in 1989, our typical crime scene kit was a briefcase you know, packed with, you know, plastic bags, paper bags, you know, your evidence tape, your, yeah. uh, was that similar kind of equipment you guys? We, we, we had stuffed everything we thought we needed in a satchel. Okay. Uh, knowing that we had to keep the baggage to a, a minimum. And uh, we all had two other guys that were with us that were just carrying a backpack. So uh, they were helpful in helping us get the equipment off, but uh, that, that wasn't a problem. And as soon as we got on the, on the ice, we had people there to help us carry stuff in. So when you guys, and, uh, the helicopter is just hovering above the ice and you guys- Yeah, off the it helicopter. Didn't, didn't turn off. It had skids on it. It was on, on the top of the ice so that it wouldn't go go in. But, you know, they, they were happy to say goodbye to us and say, see you in a day and a half. Mm -hmm. You better be ready to go because <laughs> we're, we're not going to turn, we're not going to turn this engine off. We don't know it's going to start again. But then when they came back in a day and a half, they did turn the engine off. <laughs> With, with the oil, possible oil leak. Oh my gosh. So Bill Stevens meets you guys and you go to the, uh, what was your first impressions of the facility there at Ice Island? Well, uh, I I was not really surprised. I was expecting to be, I noticed that, that, that Dick said that it was shocking. Uh, I don't know that he would have said that because it, it looked like a uh, the way you'd have a base on the, uh, uh, on ice, and uh, uh, they used a 55-gallon uh, uh, barrel as a place to defecate. But when they built that, they put a, a cabin over the top so it'd be warmer in there. Mm -hmm. But then the ice would melt in this at, the, at this time of the year. The ice would melt around it, and they'd have to keep chipping away steps to get up and in, into it because the the cover for it. Uh, protected it so you could see how much melting there was on the surface ice wow uh, and uh 
then it was that was one of the interesting part about it. I, I, you, you think, well, how do they get rid of this? You know, once they want to change the 55 gallon drum, what do they do? Is we just pull it down, wait until the ice is uh, frozen, and take it out uh, 200 yards, drill a hole, put it down. And I said, how long have you been doing that? They said, for years. And I says, what happens when, what happens when the ice melts? And he said, well, every once in a while you hear a pop. And then, and then. <laughs> and that's <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. no, none of the aircraft that come in want to take it out. So <laughs> I don't think EPA would have liked that. Oh, that's so, that's very good. That's that's humorous. So, the, uh, so you guys uh, go in, go to the facility. Uh, what's your first What's your first thoughts? Did you guys st strategize before you got there? How we're going oh yeah, to yeah. And we we ironed that out specifically as to duties okay. and worked together for a little whatever he felt we needed. I helped him with the with the crime scene, but then he could use uh, one of the other people there that was willing to help us with regard to measurements and everything. And uh, then uh, we'd, we'd talk and we'd see what we had. And, you know, even from the from the get-go, uh, I, I got the feeling that there had been 10 days since the incident occurred. And that was long enough time to realize that these people aren't gonna hurt each other. It was it was not a, a, a crime that uh, there was, sides being taken or vengeance in, in, in evidence. And everybody was, was cooperative mm -hmm. uh, as, as much as they could be. Uh, some didn't want to get involved. And, uh, but the, anybody that was close to the whole situation leading up to it, we got statements from them and we were relatively uh, finished. Uh, allowed three hours at the end for interview of the suspect and he turned us down right away, asked for an attorney, and we did we didn't get anything out of him, which others told us that he's not going to talk to you because he won't talk to any of us either. Uh, and uh, that was uh, that was pretty much it for the next day and a half, and we were pretty exhausted uh, when we were being and and the weather was coming in. Uh, it, it, we needed to get out. When we did, and get uh, it would have been perhaps days, if not weeks, mm -hmm. to get out uh, if we had waited for another twenty-four hours. Got out there just in time. So this apprehension of Escamilla occurred. The Coast Guard petty officer did his work uh, conducting the apprehension. Tell me what that was all. What that was like? Um, as you guys were, um, was there any? conversation anything other than him being apprehended and putting him on the aircraft nope it was uh, it, it was a five five to ten minute operation there was an introduction we uh franco spent all of his time uh playing pool and playing the guitar and uh, mm -hmm. having a good time in the mess hall and they were all very happy to have somebody from the states come in because they had all arrived on the first of june and here it was the end of July, and they hadn't seen anybody, and they weren't going to see any other human being until one October. If they couldn't get off, and uh, they were trying to buy a ticket back with us, but uh, that that was going to occur. But uh, Frank, uh, we just led him into where we had uh, uh, Mario, and uh, we introduced the two of them, and uh, had him stand and. Frank uh, said that here are my credentials. I'm a U.S. Coast Guard investigator, and uh, I hereby arrest you for uh, homicide on the uh, ice island. Do you understand? And he said yes. And, uh, and he said sign here, and that was it. And uh, uh, from that that time on, Frank uh, Frank did testify in, in court to that effect with regard to the uh, the arrest at sea uh, for an American citizen for homicide. And they kept that, the FBI kept that in the, in the court action uh, later. That was in the end of September. Uh, and I think by the end of October, 
was uh, when the, the court decided that uh, he was guilty of uh, manslaughter and he was going to serve uh, four years and they took him off uh, from court and put him in prison in uh, Alexandria mm -hmm. and uh, they immediately appealed it and but it was it was probably three months before the appeal came through mm -hmm. in which uh, they they did by that time the FBI had finished the investigation on the weapon mm -hmm. because they claimed he, he he apparently admitted to his defense people. He said, "I don't know why the weapon." We've heard about later. He says, "I don't know why it went off. I was shaken so much mm -hmm. that it did go off, and I, I and that's why afterwards I admitted that yeah. that I shot him, yeah. and that's that's the first thing he said uh, after uh, the incident occurred." And well, let me ask you this, um, Jigs. I, when I was reading through the documents on this thing, when Letsy went to um, retrieve the wine or retrieve the weapon from uh, Escamilla, um, was there a confrontation between the two? Because I'm just trying to say, was there a motive for him to kill uh, uh, Letsy? Um, uh, for Escamilla to kill Letsy? No. Uh -huh. the, 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 only, the only motive he had was that, is that uh, Leitze ha had a good relationship with him, and, and I think he probably told him, hey, put the weapon down, you know, we're, we're friends here. Yeah. And he says, no, he says, I'm serious. I uh, I, I, do not, under any circumstances, want to be around uh, Porky when he's drinking, and you're now going to give him more uh, more wine for the party, and I, I, I can't have you do that. Mm -hmm. And it was within... By that time, uh, the uh, per Perotti had left to take somebody else back to a, to their uh, apartment, to their uh, pooch, mm -hmm. and uh, he had he had seen through through the through the doorway that this was happening. But he 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 was concerned about it, and so concerned that he was telling other people stay away from that. And then all of a sudden, there was a the, the gun went off, oh and then when uh, Perotti walked in, he said, "What's happening?" And they quickly tried to bring uh, bring Lightsey back to back to life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when he explained that he said, "I shot him," mm -hmm. and uh, but he was he was emotional and sat down, and uh, it went from there. Did Lightsey uh, make any final statements before he died uh, that could have backed up uh, Escamilla's well, story? You no, know, he, he made, he, he was shot near the heart on the left-hand side, near his uh, left breast, mm -hmm. rolling through his body. We found it in a wall. Mm -hmm. uh, so he didn't, he was incapacitated from the time he, he got hit. Mm -hmm. So you guys, when uh, so in court, so he goes through this process. He gets convicted of manslaughter, but then there's the appeals that goes through, talking about as you mentioned, uh, his story about I don't know how it, I was shaking so badly the rifle went off. Um, talk a little bit about that as far as the appeals process. I I was not involved in that and uh, never got uh, called for any kind of testimony. Dick did one on one one occasion, mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, since we had not uh, had any capability or time to investigate the weapon while it was there, mm -hmm. that was the very last thing we did was to accumulate that with the body mm -hmm. just before the pilot was coming in. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any equipment to do it. So we, other than to see that the, what was, the weapon was there. So uh, we did, uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't touch it. I didn't unwrap it. They wrapped it in a sheet and a blanket and tied it up and put it beside the stretcher, stretcher with the body. Mm -hmm. So when we, we processed the body the night before and uh, we observed the fact that the, the bullet had gone all the way through his body and mm -hmm. that they had cleaned up his, uh, his body. In fact, I had, I had a shot of his uh, chest. I took a picture of his chest with his shirt open but uh, other than that uh, there was 
no further action by us or until the FBI got the body. Right. So the, the uh, when when Dick did the crime scene, um, I'm sure he had uh, he may have talked to some people that talked a little bit how it happened. So did he determine based on the wounds, the injuries on the victim? Um, was it a contact wound or was it a, a close uh, a r range uh, shot? Yeah. Yeah. It, it appeared to be a close range shot within, um, I would say, within three feet. Mm, interesting. He was, they were close. It, it was confined uh, living conditions. So, but uh, there wasn't any question about him getting getting hit with it. They didn't have to aim it. It was, yeah. it, was uh, it was it was easy to see. And uh, but uh, there were no there were no marks on the on the body mm -hmm. to show that uh, there was any contact wound. Mm -hmm. it was, you know what's interesting about this is we talked this a little bit before the interview started was had had Escamilla talked to you guys in some fashion before he you know he tight he uh, this may have been worked out before any of these issues uh, had to go to court um, because you're, exact, you're exactly right. And they had, a, I think they had enough written evidence uh, shortly after the fact that uh, this, this Britain I was telling you about uh, got uh, some of the statements. So he was trying to get a motive mm -hmm. and none of them had any motive. They were friends and they, they liked Mario and they liked Escamilla uh, ask me like them. There were, there was no evidence of animosity or ill feeling. It was just this one incident the week before that that triggered him to say, "I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to be running away from this guy with his with the knife that's following me around uh, when he's intoxicated." So that that triggered him, and he he admitted even during that week he went to. Escamilla, he went or he went to Stevens and said, "We got to do something about this." Uh, but then again, he he uh, he was one the one that made the uh, made the the liquor. He was the one that that had it. It was a raisin wine, and they they had uh, fifteen gallons of it. And at the time they made it, and they would have pulled that in a different location and. Uh, Perot, Chuck Perotti and Escamilla were in charge of it. You know, it's interesting because um, when I was uh, reading or looking at some other documents as far as uh, this case uh, being so unique, um, you, um, and it's interesting because there's a couple of things that I think is really interesting about this, uh, that other than the crime scene and the investigation, because I think you guys did a fantastic job on it. It's exactly how we do things still today. Um, you know, there's a lot of tools that we have that you didn't have back in those days, but what you did was exactly like Prince always says, a carrier agent. Uh, when I had a death on board the ship, you know, sometimes you got to do everything. You got to be the jack of all trades. You got to do the sure. You got to do the photography. You got to do, you know, the documentation of the scene. You got to do the interviews. And, you know, and sometimes if you're lucky, you might have an investigator from the Navy to help you out. Um, you guys did a fantastic job in really interesting and, and treacherous conditions. You got 36 hours, you finish it up in 34 hours when the aircraft arrives and you got you got to you, you within two hours, you got to get off of that place. Right. And uh, get back yeah, to we were, rest. We were we were happy to and we were exhausted because we hadn't had any rest at all. And uh, yeah. there was there was pressure. But uh, oh. we we uh, we we did what we felt like was necessary to do. And the, the bureau came back to us and didn't find, you know, any uh any problems with them mm -hmm. passing the evidence over to them and mm -hmm. everything went uh, smoothly in the, in the court, except they, they could not get the witnesses mm -hmm. to leave ice Island during the, <laughs> during the trial, because there was no way to get them back. And, <laughs> they were smarter than y'all. They, they're not going to get on a helicopter and fly back. No way. No. But, so there's one other really interesting aspect of this case. So you guys fly this the suspect back to Thule uh, Air Force Base in Greenland. Talk about that aspect of because we talk about the jurisdictional issues. Canada had kind of waived jurisdiction, and um, but what happened with Denmark as far as 
when you guys were flying into Thule? Well, we had alerted uh, uh, the uh, the OSI mm -hmm. to meet us at the plane and to help us escort him into their break mm -hmm. so that we could take him directly there and feed him mm -hmm. and he, he'd have a place overnight. So we're, we got in there uh, 1800 and we were finished with him by 1900. Mm -hmm. And uh, th by that time he was taken care of for the night. The next morning we get him at 0600 mm -hmm. to get out by uh, 0730 before they open up. And uh, that was all laid on before the fact. So uh, at that point, we were finished with the helicopter, say goodbye to the helicopter, and we were waiting for the, the 130 to let us know that all four of us can beat it out of there by uh, 0730. And we did, and we flew directly to Dulles, and we got in there by uh, 1130, 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And that's where the marshals came in, and then FBI came in, mm -hmm. and we were able to say goodbye to him. And, uh, that, but that landing in Thule was a strategic move um, because it allowed Denmark to have plausible deniability of the suspect. Perfect. Country. Perfect. That had to be uh, all under the table because mm -hmm. that uh, that would have really put a, a damper in any kind of prosecution. Mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't have known what to do with it. It mm -hmm. would have been wound up in world court for a long time. And sure. that I, that can happen to it. So the two state departments in, in Washington worked that out. And uh, Air Force cooperated. Uh, the district uh, prosecution people were wonderful. Uh, Justin Williams later became the, uh, the, the uh, head lawyer there and at 61 unfortunately passed away after he was running uh he was an active runner and on one sunday he passed out and had a heart attack there i i, I don't know what happened to frank love mm. uh, mckenna died about eight years ago of cancer mm. so uh, i think you're probably right uh, there the, the 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 witnesses were 10 years younger than we were. So it's possible that one of those witnesses that was there will still have remembrance of the of the situation but not have the details. Nobody else that I know of, uh, everybody else that was older than me, if they were 10 years older, they'd be over 100 now. So that that's gone forever. Well, it's a, I'm, I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to talk about this very interesting and fascinating case uh, that is uh, one of those kind that uh, stays with you forever, for sure. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny. Um, one other thing I, I, I want to mention was that by going to the North Pole, if you will, <laughs> or to the Arctic Circle, you earned your Order of the Blue Nose, um, yeah. which I, I think is uh, pretty cool. I, as, a, as, a, as a shellback, um, you know, the Navy has all kinds of traditions um, and one of those is any sailor that goes into the Arctic Circle, and there's several things you have to do, uh, but you yeah. earn your Order of the Blue Nose uh, fraternity membership. So, how does that feel to be a member of that, uh, that uh, very I, unique and small? I didn't, I didn't know about it before. It was a surprise when we both were awarded that by the Coast Guard with regard to uh, actively participating in an investigation inside the Arctic Circle. Uh, and uh, I've, I've got it uh, appropriately framed in my living room. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of wonderful. Let me see if I've got, uh, I, this was my uh, uh, Eastern District of Virginia uh, courtroom, 10th day, oh, 10th of December was the, uh, was the court action for, uh, Subpoena was issued on the 29th of September, 1970. So the last court action on him was uh, was in December uh, for this offense. And then the four years started. And then it, it, uh, he, he, within a year, they had 
the FBI, as soon as they realized, hey, this this weapon is bad, we shouldn't we, we shouldn't even prosecute him because of you know, the question about the weapon. And here's here's some of his uh, Dick's pictures. Oh wow, he, crime scene photographs. Uh, yeah, that he took crime scene photographs, and uh, this uh, you can't see this, but in the in the middle is the North Pole of this one. Uh, <laughs> <can't see> that. <laughs> This is you were uh, about that time. You were about 300, 240 to three hundred miles off, uh, close to the North Pole. Look this, at that. This is what what you go through. We went through four times uh, for the refueling, and wow. you can see that that over ice is a little scary. Oh, it uh, looks like it. You see the spike the rotor blade so close to that fuel line. Yeah, you see that spike coming out of the. The C the H three helicopter. Oh yeah, going going into the basket. Yeah. Wow. And we were sitting right behind the uh, right behind the pilot when we heard that. <laughs> Here's Dick McKenna's. Uh, uh, he he died in uh, 19, 2015. He was eight years seven years older than I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a picture. Of, McKenna at that time. Yeah, Dick McKenna. Good looking guy. Yeah. Nice it, as man. you said, as you said, or somebody said that he, he could have uh, modeled for general general uh, uh GQ, right? Yeah, I said that, yeah. <laughs> and and here here is where we came back to just a stub of this is Alert Canada. In Ellesmere Island, down here is uh, is Thule, down in, in this area. This this is this is alert here. Okay, back off a little bit. Here we go. All right, so there. Okay, so I. All right, got it. So come to come to your left a little bit. There we go. All right, there we go. I'll shoot those and, and email them to there you. It is. Oh, that's great, because what I'll do is I'll put them into the, um, yeah. the video portion of the podcast. In fact, I'll put it over this part right here, and that way people will see a, a clearer picture. There's the four of us uh, coming out of There's uh, the team, man. There's the team. Yeah. This was a Thule. Nice. Thule Air Force Base Officer's Mess. This was at midnight. The night we left. And that's uh, interesting. It is. It is sun's and, up. And, and this, I don't know that I've got. I show that to you. This is. Yep. These are the hut, hutches that they lived in. Mm -hmm. And the then trailers. I was reading a couple of articles Tra about trailers. Two. Two per trailer. Two per two per uh, trailer. Let's see, can you? Well, that's all. That's all you see there is ice. Yeah. And there's. There's 90 feet of that, and that and broke that, off. That broke off from Ellesmere Island, uh, maybe 100 years ago. Wow! And then you got this crunchy, mesh, mushy ice yeah, here because it was yeah, what, 38 it, degrees when you guys were there. Yeah, it was 38 degrees, so there were spikes, and you you go down, and sometimes you'd hit a little bit of water that was there, mm -hmm. but they also had wood to walk on. There. Did I do it? Lose it? Mm -hmm. Did he? What? I touched this and uh, did you lose my lead? Did you lose I, my? I, I can hear you fine and see you fine too. Can, can you see me? Yeah, I can see you well. Okay, well, I lost it. I lost mine here. Oh, no. You may, you may have gone, um, actually hit the button where it, uh, it video, uh, but I can see you fine here. Okay. Um, but anyway, well, listen, I. I I got to tell you, Jigs, I really enjoyed this conversation with you, man. It was, it was, and we got, you know, got some of the facts straight because as you said, like the history guy who did a great job on the kind of the historical aspect of T3 and the thing, yeah. it's like the one thing that he didn't have is what you've talked about today. So I'm glad that you were able to come on and talk about it and kind of uh, tell everyone the, the true story of the murder investigation on Ice Island. Well, thank you for taking the time to 
procure everything that you have. And uh, I, I hope that this adds to the historical aspect of it and that uh, it'll help fill in for those people 25 years afterwards and say, what's this about somebody doing a murder at a case at the North Pole? And, well, uh, it's, so so why don't we talk about that right now? So, so you have the greatest um, trivia question that will stump anyone. And you're going to give up the answer now? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give you a question. Okay. And uh, and uh, I had, uh, I'll, I'll preface it by saying uh, my eighth grade daughter was talking, or granddaughter was talking about a history class and uh, a geography class that she had in school. And I says, uh, does your geography teacher know pretty much everything? He says, he knows everything. And I says, <laughs> Why don't you go up to him and say, uh, Mr. Walton, uh, my grandfather wants to see if you can work this, uh, solve this puzzle. Uh, and if you can't, can you give me an A? He says, I can solve any puzzle about geography. <laughs> and she says, OK, I'll read it to you. And I said, just read it this. That my grandfather on July 27th was physically located somewhere in the world that no longer exists <laughs> and just stop it said i'm not asking any other questions uh -huh. but that's where he and he, he says well i'll think about that and every every couple months he'd see he'd see megan and say i'm still working on it i'm still working on it <laughs> and, he, and he never did get the fact that that this ice island melted away in 19 in 1987 after it got out of the circle around the pole, went down Baffin Bay and off the coast of Greenland, melted away and went away forever. Wow. So uh, that well, it, it, it was it was it's kind of a funny. Ha, has he ever come back and said, "I've got the answer. I've got the answer." She told. She told. She, she, she says, "Here's your A. What's the answer?" <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's good. She got it. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, you know, it's like, like the guy said on his podcast, it's like, you know, here's the thing. Uh, here's the ramp. Uh, the, why this case is so important is that in the future, let's say for instance, in space on the international space station, an American kills a German in the Japanese pod. Who's has the jurisdiction. There you go. You know? And so this kind of laid down those questions that you have to talk about with jurisdictional mm -hmm. aspects. Even when I was in Iraq, we had the extraterritorial jurisdiction aspects of investigations of civilians in, in combat zones. So, and I'm sure they did the same thing in Vietnam. So this was so unique because no one had ever talked about this or nobody ever thought about this. That's exactly right. And until it surfaced, they said, what are we going to do? And I've got a letter in here, a message from uh, the guy that was in Point Barrow saying, uh, uh, hey, somebody back there better be listening because we got work to do up here on these projects and I got I got a guy that's dead and I don't know what to do with him. And we're just now realizing that life goes on and we've got a, a job to do up here. Can you get this body out of here for us? And uh, the, the fellow that did the shooting, he needs uh, to see a psychologist quickly. He's having some he's having some problems, <clears throat> and but when you look at that, they they'd never had it, and for years they'd had people that would sign up to go up for four months, arrive the first of June, and no, they couldn't get out till the first of October, come hell or high water. There was there was no way to get them out. Wow. And uh, there there was a somebody somebody died up there, uh, and. Uh, they it, it was a they had a heart attack and died and they they had to they had to find a way to get him out mm -hmm. and they built a, a some type of a a platform yeah, extraction that, that, right? that they could they could come by and drag him and and it, and it didn't work oh. and so they just they just had to wait and hold the body until they uh, is this one of those 
one of those deals where the C-130 has like scissors on the front of it and it comes by yeah. and it grabs the wire and then they pull them up inside the plane? They, yeah. They, oh, yeah. wait a minute. I, I, <laughs> I bet he, well, he ended up dying on the island, right? <laughs> oh, he was already dead, so it didn't matter. <laughs> I can only imagine. Look, I'm, look, if I'm deathly ill, I got that, but I am not going to be pulled off the ground and sucked up into a C-130 as it flies by at 150 knots, you know? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Interesting stuff. Listen, Jigs, man, it was great having you on the podcast and on the program, YouTube channel, NCI reports in the field. You know, your case is like many cases that when they come on the show that, you know, this is such a fascinating organization um, and truly uh, the most unique and best uh, law enforcement counterintelligence agency in the U S government uh, with the department of Navy and the Marine Corps. So I'm so happy that you could come on and tell your story uh, it's just, an, that, it, and it is an amazing story. Thanks so much for doing it, Lee. And if there's any uh, questions that anybody has after the fact, I'd be happy to uh, get back to them in uh, record time. Stand by, you're going to be busy. <laughs> the new agents will be asking questions, I'm sure. All right, listen, Jigs, man, it's that's, great talking to you. That's great. Thanks for working with my daughter, Kitty. I, uh, I, I couldn't have gotten through this without her. Well, it was a pleasure. Kitty is a great lady, and I'm so glad that uh, I got to meet her today. As I re-listened to Jig's interview with his uh, daughter, Kitty, I, I got to tell you, I, I, uh, it just reminds me of all the times and the cases uh, as an NCIS agent as my, in my career that uh, at times you're called upon to do the really, really crazy or interesting case that is not in your typical crime scene. Um, you know, the one that comes to mind for me is when I, my first year uh, with NCIS, Harry Stovall, my SAC, called myself and Mark um, Lemon into uh, the office and told us we need to get over to North Island, catch a UH-1 uh, Huey, and fly out to the USS Okinawa. They have a theft problem on board the ship. Well, Mark and I went over there. I remember the uh, the process, uh, the the safety brief, if you will, they walked in with a couple of vests and some helmets, provided them to them to us, and said to us, um, "Okay, here's the deal: um, if the um, uh, aircraft goes down in the water, jump as far away from the aircraft as you can, and swim as long as you can." Uh, and that was kind of it. And um, yeah, you know, they basically admitted, Marine Corps, we don't get the best equipment; uh, we get what we get. And uh, this helicopter is Vietnam uh, era vintage. So that was kind of a, um, an eye-opening scene, much like Jiggs when he jumped in that H3 and is flying up to the North Pole, being refueled in the air multiple times. Anything could have gone wrong at any time. It's really the courage of the agents of NCIS uh, that serve the Department of Navy and Marine Corps, uh, and, and it serve those entities worldwide wherever the case may go. Um, so you're always there to go where the case takes you. And I want to thank Jiggs Kelleher once again. So happy that we had him want, uh, on the show uh, because, I mean, we don't get this opportunity all the time. Also, once again, to thank uh, retired special agent uh, Harry Richardson, who uh, uh, let me know about uh, this case um, through a podcast called The History Guy or the YouTube channel The History Guy, um, which is a fascinating. If you haven't seen it, please look it up on YouTube, The History Guy. Jiggs provides additional information to that particular interview. Jiggs watched that, and he thought it was fairly accurate. Um, just needed to add the things that uh, Jiggs provided in the end. So anyway, I want to anyway, I want to thank you for listening to uh, NCIS Reports and Field on YouTube and on Spotify or, or wherever you listen to uh, your um, podcast. Uh, I'm excited that we had Jigs on. This is one of the most fascinating cases that NCIS or NIS at the time uh, ever conducted. Um, and uh, it was a great, uh, a great honor to have Jigs Callagher and his daughter Kitty on the show. So hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you uh, will continue to listen. Please, once again, leave your comments below, uh, like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on NCIS Reports in the Field.